Okay, so, well, I wasn't able to attend or watch the meeting in full though, due to my other responsibilities. Uh, my understanding is that there were a lot of questions raised around the uh, procedures that were followed, the uh, monitoring for safety, particularly the cardiovascular and potential for substance use outcomes, um, and then concerns about uh, maintaining the blinding, the functional unblinding that you, is basically unavoidable with psychedelic treatments or MDMA. Um, and so these all raise questions, both not only about safety, but also about efficacy to the panel. Yeah, so that's a very big topic. The issue of a lesser dose was considered by the sponsor and decided not to be pursued because it actually seemed to have deleterious effect. It might be actually worse than an inert placebo. And so you'd be comparing high dose versus low dose and actually enhancing the likelihood compared to an inert placebo that the high dose would show efficacy. So that was actually considered and, and not pursued for MDMA, although that was the strategy in the psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression trial conducted by Compass, which used a low dose of psilocybin, one milligram, and a medium dose and a high dose. Um, this issue of functional unblinding is very important, and it is not new. So we have a drug that many people will know about called quetiapine. Quetiapine is a crucial component of the pharmacopoeia in psychiatry. We use it to treat bipolar disorder, uh, and it is an adjunctive agent for um, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, it's used. So it has wide uses as a valuable drug. It is absolutely functionally unblinding when you take it because even a 50 milligram dose and you will be night night real quick. And so the, this issue was raised a little bit at the time of the Seroquel studies. Uh, had that drug been uh, undergone this level of scrutiny for the functional unblinding aspect, uh, it may not have been approved because it's very clear that patients could tell that they were getting sedated from quetiapine. Um, so the idea that the efficacy measures of a drug should be um, discarded, thrown out because there's functional unblinding threatens a lot of what these drugs in psychedelics and MDMA can offer. Uh, and we are seem to be holding it to a higher standard or a new bar compared to past drug approvals. Um, there's also this uh, concept that the functional unblinding somehow can explain all the improvement that people have. Like the fact that you have a confidence that you got active drug will be so powerful to lead you to recover from your treatment, uh, from your illness through the treatment. And this is not proven. This is just hypothesized as an explanatory factor. Whereas in fact, especially in this trial, people got a lot of psychotherapy. And usually we try in clinical trials of pure drugs treatments to minimize the psychotherapeutic components. We minimize contact. We don't offer extensive sessions for counseling. Patients in this study, in these studies with MDMA received a lot of therapy in the placebo condition. So the drug, MDMA, was showing benefits above and beyond an intense amount of therapy. And we need to keep that in mind when we think about the power of the treatment. It's an, a lot of treatment is being given. And yet when you get the MDMA on top of that treatment, you get more improvement that is sustained for uh, 18 weeks. To me, to attribute that as a, to functional unblinding, as like the patient's expectation can explain these outcomes, seems to be um, more based on a, uh, a, a wish rather than the reality of, of clinical care, where many people may have placebo responses in the short term, but in chronic conditions like PTSD, um, treatment-resistant depression, they are not sustained. Typically, they lose those placebo responses over time. So I, I actually find the efficacy concerns about functional unblinding to be not very concerning about this data. I'm, I'm, I think the data is quite strong for the efficacy, the safety is a is a different question that the FDA will need to consider. Yeah, I mean, I think I break safety down into the immediate cardiovascular effects. And um, I think the FDA is best positioned to determine if that was adequately covered or not. Um, and then there's the post-dosing effect when people leave the clinic, have had a powerful experience. And can that result in some kind of psychological vulnerability? 
um, even if people are clear, like mood stable, no distorted thought process at the end of the session, there may be in some people a decline in mood post treatment, post the dosing, as serotonin levels are resolving and people may experience a low mood. Um, this is why it's important people not, I think, be alone after dosing, if they have a trusted family member or friend they can be with, and then to follow up the next day with the patient. And uh, so I think we need to recognize the power of these drugs. And a drug that is powerful also has, typically has the power to potentially induce harms and that will need close monitoring. I don't see these as insurmountable problems. Um, I see them as uh, a new space for psychiatry to require special monitoring. We've done similar things with ketamine. I think people have to be monitored after dosing for a while before they can be cleared to go home. There's ways to build in the safety for the psychological aspects of that. Um, the the other question of safety, of course, is uh, the issue of abuse or substance use. And we can talk about that if you'd like. Substance use disorders are a serious public health problem. We do not want to contribute to that, for sure. And I have great concern about efforts in states to make these drugs more widely available even before FDA approval or review. Uh, this is not the public health correct approach for, these, for the, the deployment of these medications. We all know about the opioid epidemic. I think that weighs over everything. People do not want to introduce that. I think that is not an appropriate comparator for MDMA and psilocybin. We are not sending patients home with 30 days of pills. Patients are coming to the clinic. They're getting at one dose, no more frequently than once a month, up to three doses. And in the case of the MDMA trials, they're given the drug and then talking about the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Okay. This is not how you get a reinforcing experience from a drug, okay? Usually a drug reinforcing experience or, or addicting experience is associated with a lot of, you know, joy, euphoria, bliss. And these folks are encountering and often experiencing both psychologically and somatically the trauma that they've gone through. So inherently, neurobiologically, it's not rewarding. Now, so it won't be, so I think that the likelihood that it will lead to addiction per se is quite low. Again, we only have small numbers of patients in these phase three trials to really know this. Um, but it's more like the it's it's more like there's a relief of distress from happens. Like I can talk about my trauma without all the distress that comes with it. And that could be theoretically a weaker type of reinforcement. Like I it's so it's instead of like seeking the pleasure of addiction, it's more like I'm looking to relieve the psychological distress I have with the trauma. So that would be the kind of use. So it'd be more like a, a misuse of the drug rather than a compulsive use. Um, this is what I would expect would be the risk. And so it's more about, it's not like people are going to be using MDMA every week, every few days to get repeatedly high. I think that's extremely unlikely. But that people may seek out, if they don't get adequate resolution of their trauma, memories and, and PTSD, that they might continue to seek MDMA as a potential to continue to relieve the distress they have with it. That is a possibility that I think is worth considering, and, and people need to be followed out carefully for that. Uh, but I, I, I don't think the uh, associations to the opioid epidemic have any real connection. Those are, the, I, to me, those are really two different pots of addiction that uh, shouldn't be conflated.